a London tour shines a light on corrupt Nigerian money funneled through pricey real estate. The dangers of contact sports on the brain and why children are especially vulnerable. And using art to reveal your inner shopping desires. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McQuarrie. This is Africa 54. Anti-corruption activists are hoping to shine a light on the hundreds of millions of dollars funneled through London every year by organizing tours of properties allegedly bought with suspect money. Now, the latest tour focuses on corrupt money coming from Nigeria. And Ridgewa reports from London. Its leaseholders are named in UK government records as two offshore vehicles linked to Siraki and or his wife Toyin in the Panama Papers. The kleptocracy tour is billed as a journey to the dark side of globalization and the Star Wars analogies do not end there. That essentially the Death Star of globalization is right here and it's London. Activists say Britain is sucking in corrupt money from across the world. This is the first kleptocracy tour focusing on Nigeria. Matthew Page is a former U.S. State Department Nigeria analyst, now with Transparency International. The international community, specifically the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, other financial centers, are playing a huge role in facilitating uh, elite corruption in Nigeria through offshore corporate tax havens, lax uh, banking and, and property laws. First stop is the capital's wealthy Belgravia district. Tax papers leaked from the Panama-based law firm Mossack Fonseca suggest two multi-million dollar properties are linked to Nigerian Senate President Bukola Saraki. He has denied the allegations. Next up, several lavish properties that have been subjected to asset forfeiture proceedings by a court in Houston, Texas. The U.S. Department of Justice is investigating allegations they were received as bribes by Diazani Alison Madueke, the former Nigerian oil minister and OPEC secretary. Activists say Nigeria's president is following through, though slowly, on pledges to crack down on corruption, which has such a corrosive effect. I think it contributes to poverty, contributes to poor education, contributes to terrorism. Um, you have communities where the young men are compelled to or feel driven into the arms of organizations like Boko Haram as a result of the deprivation which results from corruption. Nigeria's information minister told VOA that the West must do more to help repatriate corrupt money. The government would not uh relent, you know, in pursuing this way, but we also need the cooperation of many of the foreign uh, uh, countries because so sometimes we, we are hampered uh, by the foreign jurisdictions. An estimated $100 billion of corrupt money passes through London each year. Activists say fears over the economy following Brexit are stalling government efforts to clamp down on global corruption, an industry with the British capital at its core. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Well, in West Africa, three U.S. soldiers were killed and two others injured in an attack in southwest Niger while on a joint patrol with Nigerian troops, U.S. African Command confirmed in a statement on Thursday. The statement also revealed that another partner nation soldier died in Wednesday's attack, but it did not specify the nationality of the victim. The wounded are reported to be in stable condition and have been evacuated to a medical center in Germany. For more on the attack in Niger, I'm joined uh, uh, by Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb. Uh, Carla, what more do you know about this attack? Well, Vincent, I've just learned that the three killed were U.S. Um, Army members, and they were part of the Green Berets. That's the Army Special Forces. I can also confirm that that partner force member that was killed was a member of Niger's Armed Forces. We also know from French officials that they did help with the evacuation after the attack. But what we still don't know is who's responsible for this. We understand that Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and also pockets of Islamic State operate in that area. Boko Haram is also in the country, although it hasn't necessarily been known to be in that area. So it's still really unclear which terrorist group, if any, was responsible for this. And we'll be checking with you to see what more you may know in the coming days. But we hear that there is some 
other news regarding the fight against ISIS from the Pentagon. That's right. Just today, uh, Iraqi forces backed by the coalition have liberated the city of Hawija. That's near Kirkuk. This is one of the last major strongholds in Iraq. In fact, we're learning that more than a thousand Islamic State terrorists surrendered during this attack, and it only took 14 days to free them from Islamic State control. So that, that's really good progress for the Iraqis in their fight against the militants. And if we talk about this is a kind of a new strategy here that is being employed by the Pentagon. Can you tell us a little bit about it and tell us what the difference is uh, with the one that was in place during the Obama administration? That's right, Vince, and it has been a very busy week over here at the Pentagon. Uh, we, we mentioned Africa, we've mentioned the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, and also in Afghanistan, the new strategy was kind of laid out by Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis. He says that the biggest difference between this administration and the Obama administration is that the gloves are off when it comes to airstrikes. They're still doing everything they can to protect civilians, but instead of having these rules, one of them being proximity, the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda forces had to be within a certain distance from the U.S. forces or the uh, Afghan forces, those rules are off the table. If they're an enemy and they're in the sights of, of the United States, they can be a target. This helps to uh, get the Afghan f forces um, bolder, uh, bolder offensives. Every single one of the Afghan units now have somebody on the offensive, and Secretary Mattis says that if they don't have to worry about the high ground because the airstrikes from the U.S. forces are going to take care of the high ground for them, they can do more. The goal of this, the goal of these new airstrikes, the goal of adding 3,000 U.S. forces into this is to help improve the Afghan government and improve their forces so they can bring the Taliban to the negotiating table. The Taliban for several years think that if they just wait it out one more year, wait it out one more year, they can eventually win this thing. And Secretary Mattis says that these next steps have proven that the United States is not going to go anywhere. They have gotten rid of the, the timelines for withdrawal because they are going to be there as long as it takes for the Afghan forces to bring the Taliban to negotiate peace. That is the final solution. And the last thing he said in, the, in that um, in the hearing that he had earlier this week was that those 3,000 forces were mainly going to be used to advise and assist at the brigade level, going down even further. They're not going to be fighting this war for the Afghans. They're going to be helping them because he said every time that okay. the Afghans were fighting the Taliban with the advice of the U.S., they were winning, and he wants to keep that going. It's a tough war there. Thanks a lot, Carla. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, that's a viewer's Carla Bam reporting live from the Pentagon. Now, the United Nations and its partners are reorganizing the protection of a civilian site in South Sudan in an effort to improve security and living conditions. A fresh outbreak of violence in April prompted a sudden surge of people seeking sanctuary. The congested UN compound for internally displaced people in Wau is home to some 39,000 people. A number of young men were found in the area during a recent patrol. Most cooperated, but some resisted. They were briefly held, searched and questioned. The site currently provides only one to five square meters of space per person compared to the 30 square meters seen as the ideal in an emergency sitting setting rather. Now the site was established when civil war broke out in 2016. Conditions in the compound had deteriorated considerably causing fears of disease, outbreaks and hygiene concerns. Now Malawi has made a U-turn on the road to recovery after three years of drought, floods, poor crops, budget deficits and running the country without donor budgetary support. That's according to Malawi's president Peter Mutarika. He says the nation's economy could grow by 5%. VOS Peter Klotz recently interviewed the president, who says he is looking to reform the government, focus on rural, uh, on, uh, rural growth, making sure the agriculture sector has the resources it needs to grow, including roads, schools, and hospitals. Very, very encouraging. I'm sure you know the history of what happened in uh, Kashgate in 2013. Uh, when you go into the government, um, there was no money in the treasury uh, because of cash gate, uh, that mass massive looting uh, of government resources. Um, the, uh, the donors left. And the donors were providing 40 percent of the recurrent budget. And so that was a real challenge, and I think that was affected. But now the economy is beginning to grow. Uh, you probably have seen that when I took over the country, 
Inflation was 24.6%. Now, as of last month, it's 9.3%. Single digit, the first time since uh, uh, December 2010. That's right, single digit inflation, the interest rates uh, were about 40 something percent, now down to no, about no. 24, which is so high, but much it's better so than it, it, it has been in MMI for, for the last uh, five or 10 years. Uh, so the economy is beginning to pick up. Uh, my advisors tell me that uh, this year, last year, the growth rate was 2.7. They think we should have more than 5%. So with the stringent um, spending cut that you put in, uh, yeah, how effective has it been and what would you say has been the success story of it? Yeah, I think it's been very effective. Cut back. And they try to invest in uh, growth areas like agriculture and others, so of course, education, social areas too, uh, infrastructure, uh, and foreign investment. So a combination of other things. We embarked on a program of attracting foreign investment. God knows I've been everywhere. I've been to China, I've been to UK, Brussels, wherever. Uh, where any, anybody could listen to me, I've been there. Uh, trying to attract foreign investment, in addition to have investment forums in Mali itself. Uh, and it has paid off. A number of companies are now coming in, uh, both from the east and also from the west, from Japan, China, India, but also from the west, from the United Kingdom, investing in different sectors, investing in uh, um, uh, the energy sector, health, education, agriculture, infrastructure, all across the board. And uh, are doing quite well. We want more. Uh, we are trying to create an environment which continues to be attractive uh, to uh, foreign investors. So it's a combination of all those things, I think. And, and you know, usually these investors look at the governance of the, of the country. Indeed. Yeah, they look at the political stability in the right. country before they come in. Right. What would you say has been the selling point of Malawi in terms of good uh, uh, governance? Very good question. First of all, as you know, Malawi is very peaceful. It's one of the most peaceful countries anywhere in the world. On the peace index, I think that Malawi is number five. And that's very important because investors, when they go to a country, they look for two things. Uh, they want security or they want markets. Now, in terms of security, I've assured investors, two types of security. They want physical security. They are farmers and, and so forth. Um, and I assure them that their kids will go to good schools and we have uh, very good schools in Malawi, as you know, carved from the you know, colonial uh, system. Um, so, so I've assured investors that if they come to Malawi, they'll be protected at home, at work, and in between. You know, so, so that I can guarantee, uh, because crime rate has gone down this past year by 5%. Um, and then they also look for investment security in the sense of uh, uh, their commercial security, uh, that their property will not be nationalized or and fairly taxed and so forth. And uh, Malawi is a part of a number of international conventions on the protection of foreign investment, uh, but also it, it's also we have local laws and a very, very viable uh, judicial system that will enable an investor, if there's a dispute, to go to court and receive fair treatment. Mm. Mr. President, in, in your initial submission, you talked about uh, the looting of public funds. Yes. Um, let's look at the fight against corruption. Yeah. Uh, where is it now at the moment? Uh, how is the fight against corruption? Yeah. yeah. No, I think the fight is, is a tough fight. Um, I, I've said yeah, that there's corruption everywhere. Uh, but, but I think the fight can be won. Now, we've done a number of things. Uh, first of all, to sensitize people. You see, there are two aspects of fighting corruption, preventive and then prosecutorial. First, preventive, uh, make sure that in almost every organization there's an integrity committee uh, that censors people about corruption. And that's very, very important. Some of your critics are saying that, oh, the president is using the fight against corruption to go after his opponent. How, how do you respond to that? I, I, th I think that's completely wrong. You see, the reason why they're saying that is very simple. That uh, <clears throat> cash gate, most of the cases in the cash gate, took place under the government of, of uh, People's Party government. A combination of politicians, civil servants, and business people uh, during that regime. 
So that's why the investigation, investigations are so it's obvious that the people who are actually being investigated, both by the ACB and the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, mm -hmm. are people from the People's Party. That's when Castro took place. So it's a political thing. You see, the, the trouble is that uh, people want you to fight corruption. But at the same time, they don't want anybody to be indicted. But you cannot fight corruption without arresting somebody. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Also find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Now coming up, the risks of contact sports on our brains. Stay with us. news and notes. This is Living Better. A program run by tattoo artists in Bolivia is helping people with vitiligo, a skin condition that causes white patches. Many patients feel isolated by the condition and some are turning to tattooing as a remedy. Es una técnica que no es abrasiva. It's applied only on the top part of the skin, says tattoo artist Enrique Castro. We inject the pigment delicately. Recipient Irene Flores says she likes what it's done for vitiligo on her face. She says, I see a lot of change, and if I'm going to use makeup, it will not be as much as I used to. While the emotional benefit for patients is apparent, Dermatologists warn that in some cases, skin trauma like needle punctures can actually worsen vitiligo, and they urge that patients seek advice from their doctor before considering such options. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. Well, it's time now for Health Report, and joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Medu. Today, Lino has more of an interview with Dr. Bennett Omalu on brain trauma initiated from sports. Uh, Lino? Thanks, Vincent. In part two of my discussion with Dr. Bennett Omalu, the forensic pathologist who discovered chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, and was played by Will Smith in the movie Concussion, he reiterates the dangers of contact sports on the brain, especially for children, and discusses his newly released book, Truth Doesn't Have a Side. I found a disease that no one has ever seen. Repetitive head trauma chokes the brain. Knowing what we know today in science, centuries of work by very intelligent people, there is no justifiable reason whatsoever why any child under the age of 18 should continue to play the high-impact, high-contact collision sports. The big six are American football, ice hockey, mixed martial arts, rugby, boxing, and wrestling. For the less contact, less impact sports like soccer, there should not be any heading below the age of 18. 18 is when you become an adult, when your brain becomes fully developed. And children under the ages of 12 to 14 shouldn't play soccer as we play today. Because soccer is a high dexterity sport. And it's a sport that requires very high levels of visual spatial coordination. Children don't have that. That is why concussion rates are very high in soccer amongst children. So we should develop a less dribble, less contact type of soccer for children. Then lacrosse. I don't think any child under 18 should play lacrosse. Lacrosse has the highest levels of concussions amongst all sports. Children should play the non-contact, non-impact sports. Track and field, swimming, table tennis, lawn tennis, badminton volleyball, basketball. There are so many of them. If you visit the International Olympics Committee website, the non-contact sports will give your child everything ice hockey, football, or rugby would give your child, but even more. The non-contact sports will protect your child's intelligence. The high-impact, high-contact sports expose your child to repeated blows of the head. 
and repeated blows of the head over time, with or without suffering a concussion, with or without a helmet, destroys your child's mind and takes away your child's intelligence. You told your story in this book, Truth Doesn't Have a Side. Yes. So what is your message today? I spent almost one year writing this book to help each and every parent answer that question. Do I love sports? Do I love football? Do I love ice hockey? Or do I love rugby more than I love my child? Easy question to answer. No sports will supersede the love of a parent for their child. You. Yet, you see how some children will have that passion. I want to play American football. I want to play rugby. You know, if we come back to football, just very briefly, are there some positions within the game that are less dangerous? Or are there some ways that children can play but can be protected no. better? You, okay. uh, we cannot make football safe. Thank you for what you've just said. And it, there's a chapter in the book about the, your question. If your child runs to you, mommy, 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 I want a smoky stick of cigarette, please. What would you tell your child? No, because smoking a cigarette could be harmful for your child. But if that child calls, oh, mommy, mommy, I want to play football, please. You put on a helmet on his head, send him out to a field to suffer concussions. I think a lot of it also has to do with the lack of the education and information. People don't know, parents don't know. It's not intentional in many cases. And that is why this book is a must read for each and every parent. Because if your child's brain is damaged tomorrow, your response shouldn't be, I did not know. Mm. I've sacrificed too much, so much of my life and career to get to where we are today. It's a compelling story. I read the book and uh, it's really incredible. Just to touch on your personal journey, you wanted to be a pilot, you became a doctor because you, you wanted to please your dad, you became a pathologist because you didn't know what else to do in, med in the field of medicine. I gave a commencement speech in Ireland to the Royal Colleges of Surgeons and in my speech I said to the graduating class, success is not guaranteed in life. What is guaranteed in life is failure failure, shortcomings, inadequacies, insufficiencies, is guaranteed. But what will make you successful is your ability to convert your failure into success. Along my journey of life, I encountered numerous uncountable failures and hurdles. So what I did was I embraced those failures, is okay, but turned them around and created successes from them, created value from them. So my, the message is, no matter who you may be, where you are, you fail. It's okay to fail. Don't beat upon yourself. Embrace it. Walk with it. Turn it around. That was all I did at various stages of my life. I, I would fail. I'll embrace it. I'll turn it around. And that was uh, Dr. Bennett Omalu, forensic pathologist. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Back to you, Vincent. A very, very insightful interview there. Thank you, Lenore. Be sure to watch Lenore Moudou's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Could art be the key to understanding how we shop? We'll be right back. It's not because I am uh, daring to talk that uh, there is freedom of expression in Rwanda. No, there's none.
Welcome back to Africa 54. And here's what's trending. It may not look like it, but this woman is going shopping. She's trying out the art of shopping, a new high-tech shopping experience that uses art and uh, neuroscience. It works using headsets that monitor users' neurological responses. The shopper enters a so-called inspirational zone that is filled with 10 modern artworks carefully selected by such art. Users' movements are tracked. Each artwork is intended to provoke movements of creativity and inspiration. It's claimed to be the world's first subconscious shopping experience. Users are provided with a personalized online shopping cart uh, that's based on their readings. And now the aim is to inspire shoppers to purchase unique things they truly want rather than simply following the crowd. Well, next up, a decade ago, weddings in Tajikistan were lavish affairs that lasted for days with guest lists running into the thousands. But then the country's president brought in uh, legislation to limit the size and expense of weddings birthday parties and funerals. In a country of 8 million residents, more than half of them living below the poverty line, people used to spend $220 million on weddings every year. Lawmakers were pleased with the downsizing trend, but the central importance of wedding celebrations in Tajik uh, culture made it difficult for people to accept restrictions. Since the legislation was introduced, hundreds of people have been prosecuted and fined a total of more than $1 million. And finally, nails have been turned into miniature works of art depicting nightmares, woody nymphs and mermaids at the Nail Olympics in London. Competitors are allowed to unleash their imaginations and create extraordinary sculptures out of their models' uh, nails. And whatever the artist chooses, uh, the judges are always looking for the same things. Uh, creativity, accuracy and attention to detail with Halloween around the corner is not surprising the themes of some of the nail contestants are so dark. Organizers say the next Nail Olympic event will be in Houston, Texas. And that is what is trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Now, be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, Break Africa, that's between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from 